Oh man, real life has been kicking my butt with school and work for the last like week and a half, so oops, no uploads, but hey, we're back, and today's topic is going to be half rant, half lore episode, because I'm indulging in arguably the oldest and most famous pastime mankind has, getting really angry at things that are utterly irrelevant. Today, we are covering just the worst character in Battlestar Galactica. People love to meme about it being Leodama because the writers fumbled the ball really hard with him and the Pegasus, but no. Today we're talking about Admiral Helena Kane, a character so painfully dumb that she only survived as long as she did by the grace of plot armor thicker than the Mercury's hull plating. We're gonna cover her origins, who she is, why she sucks, and how she went so insane she started intentionally helping the Cylon genocide of mankind. Also, she is a moron, and I hate her. Generic greetings, and welcome to Science Insanity, a channel dedicated to bringing my love of sci-fi and its often not-so-great writing to you, the viewer. And like I said, today we're doing a character bio, synopsis, history thing on Helena Kane from Battlestar Galactica. But before we get into the topic of the day, shameless begging. If you enjoy the video or our content, then consider subscribing, leaving a like, commenting, all that good stuff to help fight the algorithm gods and get side of the next major milestone by the end of the year. It's a big goal for about a month, but the channel's done insane numbers before and I'm hoping lightning can strike twice. If you want to support us directly though, check out our Patreon, or if you just want to hang out with a small but growing community of turbo nerds, we have a Discord. Everything linked in the video description below. And with that, Helena Kane. Kane is, or I guess was, an admiral in the Colonial Navy before the fall of the Twelve Colonies. Captain of the Mercury-class Battlestar Pegasus and one of only two known warships to escape the Cylon Genocide. Unfortunately, she went insane, made every wrong decision imaginable, and then got shot in the face by a robot, whom she had been sleeping with, torturing and then abusing. I, I will explain later, but nothing I just said was a lie. Let's start with her origins, and because I don't like this character, as I have repeatedly said, I'm going to lampshade all of the important and serious details with humor, because the easiest way to invalidate something is to laugh at it. Starting with her homeworld. Hailing from the system of Helios Alpha, Cain was born on planet Cow, about 50 years before the fall of the Twelve Colonies, during the early years of the First Cylon War. Her homeworld was Tauron. In fact, while we're on the subject, do you want to take a wild guess what the main economic output of Tauron was? Tauron? Whatever it is, however you pronounce that. It was cows. Ranching and raising cattle. Planet Cow. Responsible for raising beef for the Twelve Colonies. What amazing lore for the homeworld of such an important character in the setting. Amazing. Sometimes Battlestar Galactica has just such amazing lore and background information, like Caprica being the cultural and scientific heart of mankind, a de facto leading the colonies in spite of the animosity and resentment they've fostered. That arrogant place at the top eventually blinding them and leading to unchecked advancement ending in the Cylons. Caprica is the story of arrogance and willful ignorance through ego brought about by their success and glory. Then you have Tauron. Hmm, yes, planet cow, re ranch cattle, hmm, very poor, hmm, good world, yes. Anyways, Cain was born on this world in the early years of the war. For the most part, left untouched by the wider conflict, this relative peace let Tauron continue its development and slow climb out of its role as a colony and breadbasket for Leonis and Vergon, the original superpowers of the Helio system and mankind. When the Cylon War came to an end, Tauron got royally blasted. In what was pretty much the last act of the Cylon War, a fleet of toasters broke through to the planet and bombarded multiple cities bef before landing an army of centurions and engaging the Torian military on the ground. This is where Kane's first interactions with the toasters happened. She tried to flee with her family, only to be separated from her parents while taking shelter in a ruined city block that hosted a unit of soldiers. Kane and her sister tried to find safety with the military, which is probably a terrible idea. Generally, the front lines of a war is a really bad place to try and find safety. So, as one would expect against the Terminators, the Cylon advance eventually reached their positions, and in the ensuing firefight, Kane lost track of her sister, only catching one last glimpse of her as the Cylon Centurions dragged her back towards a transport and off the planet. As it turns out, moments afterwards, the fighting ceased as the armistice was officially signed and put into place the Cylons retreating off Toron soon after. So the first time Cain ever interacted with the Cylons was to watch them burn down everything she's ever known, kill her family, and kidnap her sister while she could only try and run away, and even that didn't really work because, well, the Cylons are really, really good at butchering their way through compact, crowded areas. That's literally what they were designed to do in the first place as military drones. 
And uh, I don't know if it's exactly accurate, but you could definitely say that because of the Cylons being robots, Kane just completed a tool-assisted speedrun of severe childhood trauma. And in the years after the Armistice, Kane would eventually join the Colonial Navy as soon as she was old enough to do so. With a massive chip on her shoulder, she threw herself into what all trash peacetime officers do, politicking and boot -king. So. Something important to state here for anyone who thinks Kane is just a ruthless bastard or some badass rags to admiralty story, she isn't. By all accounts, she was mid, distinctly unimpressive, special in how unspecial she was, the human equivalent of a hospital food. But what she was exceedingly good at was sucking up to the people that mattered and making herself seem like more than she was. Over the years, Kane managed to gain a number of important political connections and functionally skipped the entire promotion ladder. She essentially fast-tracked her way to the rear admiral rank by brown-nosing, and it's directly stated that she was promoted over most of the other commanders on the list. It's also really important to mention that Kane was trained and grew up in the interwar period, the 40-odd years between the First Cylon War and the Holocaust of the Colonies, and there were a few key differences in the mentality of the admiralty and the colonial military overall. As a lot of new officers and soldiers joined up to replace the crippling losses suffered during the war and help increase the size of the colonial fleet, they started to shift uh, goals and objectives, let's say. For the first Cylon War, it was essentially, oh god, try not to die. A focus on huge, defensive, and highly powerful warships meant to defend against overwhelming Cylon numbers and missile swarms that eventually culminated in the Jupiter-class Battlestar, all reliable, the gun brick herself. However, many of the new hires, so to say, were like, no, fuck that, we aren't defending against the Cylons again. That's what let them bomb our worlds and kill our people. We're going on the offensive. So the thinking of the colonies shifted to hit first, hit hard, and don't stop hitting kind of strategy and mentality that ended up becoming dominant. This is what Kane was trained and, for lack of a better term, indoctrinated into. This was an absolute shit mentality, by the way, since once the Cylons attacked, the colonial fleet rushed headlong into battle without stopping to think or understand what was happening, why half the fleet was gone, and how the Cylons managed to entirely bypass all of their early warning and defensive systems. Despite what people say about offense being the best defense, they're wrong. And we know they're wrong, because the end result was the Cylons applying copious amounts of the sun to every habitable planet they could find. It's also important to mention that despite being a rear admiral, Kane had no experience. The sum total of what all new officers had experienced was patrols, peacetime drills, anti-piracy operations, and that's really it. People like Adama, people who had not only fought in the First Cylon War but rose to command in the years after, were a dying breed. The people who actually understood what they were up against were increasingly sidelined, ignored, or put into retirement posts. Which is why when it comes to the next part, you'll start to understand why I hate Kane so much. Because when everything fell apart, when the bombs were falling, Adama put aside his military training in the Doctrine of the Era, put aside the immediate reaction drilled into him, and listened to the surviving civilian government, and fled the colonies, abandoning them to escape and save what was little left of mankind. Kane did the exact opposite. During the attack, her ship, the Pegasus, was extremely lucky. It was in dry dock, awaiting an overhaul to its systems and capabilities. While it was undergoing these alterations, the command navigation protocol was put offline, and the ship was essentially in manual, meaning that when the Cylons attacked, it was the only ship in the Scorpia shipyards, as far as we know, the only other military vessel as well, that had managed to escape. The scene is actually pretty badass though, so I'll throw Kane fans a bone here, that was probably the greatest escape and coolest reaction ever. And after ripping its moorings as it burned retro out of dock, the Pegasus jumped seconds before several more nukes would have impacted along the ship's bulk. The escape from the shipyards, though, is the last time Kane would do anything cool or smart, so get ready for a nosedive into stupid. The hate train is picking up speed, and we are about to go to plaid. Bonus points to anyone that gets that reference, by the way. Me and my brother used to make Pizza the Hut jokes for like a month after we saw that movie together. Back on track though, the Pegasus escaped the Holocaust of the Twelve Colonies, but they were in a rough spot. They were missing over 700 of the ship's crew, either dead in the initial explosion or left behind aboard the shipyards when the Pegasus fled because, well, tapping on the brakes to let them get back in would have meant everyone died. Overseeing the repairs initially and work done across the ship to prepare it for battle, 
came seemed to believe that there was still a war going on, which is strange because after the Pegasus launched recon flights to the colonies, it was abundantly clear that mankind had been bodied by the toasters. The sum total of humanity was either atoms or on the Pegasus as far as they knew. And I want to point out, this, this is not speculation, I'm not pulling this out of nowhere to say that she started to go insane around now because even her XO, the second in command, started to argue with Kane about her decisions and point out that she was starting to do things that were outright suicidal or blatantly went against what would have been the correct choice. Jürgen Belzen, the second in command, was essentially trying to play Wrangler for Kane the entire time. No, Rear Admiral, we can't charge into a fleet of 30 base stars, we probably wouldn't survive. No, Admiral, we can't deploy marines with spacesuits to make up for a lack of our vipers and our combat air patrol. No, Admiral, we can't conscript everyone left alive on the colonies, there probably aren't any to begin with. No, Admiral, you can't fist fight a planet, stop asking that, for the third time. Jürgen was essentially the only voice of reason brave enough to talk back to Kane about her increasingly stupid plans and ideas, culminating in an operation to assault and destroy a Cylon communications relay. When the Pegasus jumped in and launched its first wave of Vipers, something was obviously wrong. There were more raiders than there should have been, and what had initially been seen as a small outpost turned out to be a Cylon staging area. Jürgen pretty much immediately knew that something was very wrong, as did everyone else, but Kane wanted to press forward anyways. When multiple Cylons decided that it was time to murder the Pegasus, well, Jürgen basically went, yeah, no, it's time to go, put on his responsible pants, and the shade of man he was shone through as he suggested they recall the Vipers, flee with their tail between their legs, live to fight another day, and figure out why their intel was wrong, and why their defense grid seemed to be offline all of a sudden. And for anyone wondering, yeah, the Mercury is monstrously powerful, but the Cylons have an absolute shitload of ships. Like, it might as well be an infinite number of ships. The longer you stay in one area, the more of them are going to jump on top of them. One begets two begets four begets a whole fucking lot more really quickly when you're fighting the toasters. And the longer they stayed there, the more likely it was that overwhelming numbers of Cylon base stars and raiders would have jumped into the system. They were already being boarded by Centurions, their systems were compromised. Long story short, Jürgen understood that they couldn't win a battle of attrition and wanted to nope out. And what do you think Kane did? She immediately turned around and using Jürgen's sidearm, shot him in the head. The only guy that was actually responsible. The only guy thinking about the fact that they may be the last people alive. And in her bloodlust, Kane forced the remaining Vipers into combat, committing everything that the ship had to this pointless battle. The Vipers, suffice to say, suffered huge losses because of this, and with the Cylon Centurions murdering their way across the ship, the actual crew of the vessel as well suffered horrifically. It became a slaughter. But you want to know something else absolutely hilarious? Something truly mind-bogglingly, comedically numbing? The kind of funny where you start crying afterwards because you realize how depressing it is? The human Cylons, right? The same model of blonde bombshell that manipulated Gaius Baltar, I think. It, it might have been another one, but it, irrelevant. The same kind of Cylons that have just generally been royally fucking up mankind and were responsible for the infiltration of the CNP. Yeah, one of them was sleeping with Kane. Thanks, Kane. Not only are you so eager to start fights you can't win that you've nearly gotten your ship destroyed, like, twice in the time that you've managed to jump away and then jump back into combat, you've uh, quite literally been sleeping with the enemy. Good job. The Pegasus and her crew did manage to fight off the Cylons long enough to recover whatever was left of their fighters and jump away, but they had lost hundreds of irreplaceable lives and taken equally irreparable damage and equipment losses. All because Kane was so bloodthirsty she was willing to walk into an obvious trap and stay in the obvious trap after it was sprung because she wanted to fight. Some people defend her actions with the hardest cope of all time, which is that she knew or she understood that they wouldn't be able to get away in time and so launched more fighters to cover the ship. I've seen a lot of copium like that, and if you believe it, you're wrong. Kane is just a bloodthirsty idiot. She pissed away tons of valuable material and lives just so she could get the satisfaction of hurting the Cylons. Guess what happened to the Cylon that she was shagging, by the way? 
The humanoid one that eventually discovered and then got imprisoned, well, look, it, it's it's dark. It's really, really dark. And it's the kind of stuff where I genuinely do have to warn you, if you're sensitive to it, probably, you know, skip like a few minutes forward. Timestamp on screen to once we're past all of this. All mentions that try to avoid it using like indirect language, just, it, we, we can't. It was enhanced interrogation of the worst possible kind, it was torture of every imaginable variety, and when it became obvious that they wouldn't get anything new or significant out of the Cylon prisoner, well, Cain ordered more and more extreme treatment. Torture not just of the physical kind and all manner of pain, beatings and injuries, but also of emotional and mental torture, forcing the Cylon into extreme discomfort and abuse consistently withholding things like food or water, which they do need, they can't survive off electricity alone, and worst of all, they... how do I put this? Uh, Kane may not have ordered, but did approve of and tacitly support by not stopping the use of, um, let's call it the struggle snuggle against the Cylon prisoner, letting her crew go at it frequently and violently, and once again, there are people who cope super hard and say that it's understandable or it's fine if it isn't human so it doesn't deserve human rights. It wasn't done out of any need or requirement. It was pure sadistic retribution approved by and facilitated by Kane's leadership. Kane's greatest sin, the moment that in my opinion she went from a character doing brutal calculus to keep her ship alive, that's something we'll get to later, to an irredeemable villain, was when the Pegasus found its own civilian fleet. This was a miracle. There's no other way to put it. This small, ragtag fleet of civilian ships was a ray of hope for the Pegasus. Not only were they fully FTL capable, but also lightly armed. Some of the ships carrying a hodgepodge assortment of guns and missiles, not to mention the potential boon of extra space, more hulls, and the resources that could aid the Pegasus. A sensible captain, any sane captain really, would look at this as what it is. A chance to live, hope for the future, a sane captain would take these people and flee for their lives as fast and as far as possible and never look back. Adama, with only light convincing by Laura Roslin, abandoned his own plan to counterattack the Cylons with the Galactica and instead led the exodus from the colonies. With the Pegasus vastly more powerful FTL drives and navigation computers, it could have potentially entirely shook off the Cylons' pursuit disappearing into the vastness of space, and if its manufacturing plant can fabricate something as complicated as a Mark VII Viper, it can be retooled and altered to fabricate almost anything else they might need to set up a colony, a new home. This was the arc, this was the chance for them to just leave and start a new life somewhere and save mankind. But she didn't. Kane had them killed. She ordered the ships stripped of their FTL drives, armaments, food, water, electronics, anything they could take without physically disassembling the ships themselves. Even forcing some of the people onto the Pegasus to replenish combat losses. The families that refused to be broken up, the people who refused to be robbed, the people who fought back. She had her marines gun them down and everyone else that was left over was just abandoned, left for dead to die as the Cylons eventually found them. I've heard people still huff so much copium to try to justify what Kane did or generally pass over how she acts, but this, this is just madness. Anyone who says this is the ruthless calculus of survival is tripping. Abandoning the sublights is cold math to survive. They can't be saved in time and staying would get more people killed. So the correct decision for mankind's survival was to abandon them to the Cylons and not give them any information about where the fleet was going so that the robots couldn't follow them. Kane simply saw something that could help her quest for revenge and said damn the consequences and the lives, I'm taking it. They are not equivalent. She should have been shot the moment she suggested harming these people. And while Kane does have a few more notable moments, there's really only one thing that I think demonstrates her character at this point. The assassination plot. Adama's plan is surgical. Two people, one who's his son, one who might as well be his second, unquestionably loyal and willing to do what it takes. Shoot Kane in the head, decapitate the source of the chaos and instability, and end the issue. 
Once Kane was gone, the rest of the crew would most likely put up a fuss, but fall in line as they did when a Cylon killed her later. I don't think many people were actually particularly loyal to Kane. They were loyal to the environment of fear, uncertainty, and threat of death she created aboard the Pegasus after she capped Jurgen. Kane's plan was nothing less than the total purge of everyone who had any authority. Adama's entire command. That's him and every other officer and person in line to replace them. But I highly, highly doubt she would have stopped there. The rest of the civilian government would have been next, since Laura Roslin was a staunch ally of Adama and most of the government in general highly supported the Galactica and the people keeping them alive. Thankfully, the actions of Gaius Baltar, blessed be his dumbass, half-insane, god-guided self. The captive Cylon aboard the Pegasus escaped and managed to make it to Admiral Kane, introducing her forehead to lead at a considerable velocity and resolving the issue of her life. While a full psychoanalysis of Kane's character is unfortunately beyond me since I am, in fact, pretty fucking stupid, I can't help but think that she's already broken down before really even beginning her guerrilla war against the Cylons. The trauma from her past, the stress and horror of the Cylon genocide, the multiple near-death experiences all combined to, to all but obliterate her ability to rationally think. It's almost like she's already dead and her only goal is to hurt as much as possible the Cylons like they hurt her, and use the guise of saving humanity, fighting back, preserving what they have, and more along those lines to justify her crusade. In a rather depressing turn of phrase that I straight up stole from Castlevania, her actions and words are the longest suicide note in history. And I want to be clear, because people are going to re in the comments about how wrong I am. I'm not, I'm not talking about the sad, life is hopeless, there's no point to go on type of game over that we see when the Galactica and civilian fleet find the nuclear hellhole Earth is, and everyone is throwing the universe's biggest misery party. This is more the psychologically broken soldier that can't go home because the only thing that's left is the trenches. So they walk out into no man's land one last time because it's comfortable and familiar and easier than the alternative. Kane acts like someone who's hunting her own death, but it's too, I don't want to say cowardly because that's a remarkably insensitive term, but unable to just shut up and make out with a shotgun. So she instead holds power like a vice and excuses all manner of atrocity just to keep killing. If it weren't for the Galactica and Adama holding her back, she probably would have doomed mankind by cannibalizing the civilian fleet as well. And that is Admiral Kane, the civilian killing, Cylon laying, exo shooting villain that probably did more to help the Cylons than mankind. A traumatized little girl from Planet Cow desperately trying to hurt the bad robots. And realistically, I think the only beneficial thing she did for mankind was bringing the Pegasus to the fleet and letting them make use of it and dying. That was also very useful for mankind. And with that, we are actually done. But before we fully end out another fake out woo, huge thanks to the channel patrons, bankrolling Psy behind the scenes and assisting me in acquiring sustenance on a regular interval, with special thanks to the members of the $5 tier. David G, Augie, Eleven Bravo Crunchy, Terry Higgins, Pedro Munoz, David G, The Other One, Silencer, Vox Apollyon, Phoenix, BT Legend, Electro Boy Eleven, Logan Maynard, Mickey, David Armand, Cree Dome, Robin Stapp, at Fenrir Striker, Tachi Tukane, He's Deb, Pixie, Virtus, Fabric 445, Anchovy Bob, Mini Crustacean, Charles the Snap, Polly, Eric Jones, Joseph Holiday, Zombie the Zerker, David B, Sweet B, Rastro, Lay Butcher, Stabby Taco, Nomquam, Brian Hall, Jean Gabriel. Okay, you know, no, John. <laughs> I forgot about how complicated your name is, John. And the new guys, Lee J and Haywood J. Wor oh, God, why do you people have such complicated names? Okay, John Lee Haywood. There we go. Last three patrons. Thank you guys all very much for your support. It's appreciated greatly. I hope it'll continue. And with that, video is functionally over. I'll see you in the next one. Outros are hard. Goodbye.